get started with today's episode, I would like to quickly read you our podcast disclaimer. This podcast is for educational purposes only, and it is not to substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. You should always speak with your physician or other healthcare professionals before doing any fasting, changing your diet in any way, taking or adjusting any medications or supplements, or adopting any treatment plan for a health problem. The use of any other products or services purchased by you as a result of this podcast does not create a healthcare provider-patient relationship between you and any of the experts affiliated with this podcast. Any information and statements regarding dietary supplements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. All right, and now we'll get started with today's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Fasting Method Podcast. This is Coach Terry Lance, and I'm very excited to be here today because I have a special guest with me today. Some of you who are familiar with the TFM community know we have mentors. So people who have been in our community and know where all the resources are and have great insight, we have them kind of mentoring people. And I have with me one of our mentors, Lisa Enns. Lisa, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you, Terry. It's so good to be here. Great. I know that we've gotten to do something similar. We did a town hall meeting before today where you got to share within the community, but this is a little different, a little broader audience. So Lisa, you and I had just touched base a little bit about kind of what we wanted to make sure we had time to talk about today. And I always think it's helpful if we can start by letting people know just some about your journey to have them get to know you a bit. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, this story has been shared a few times and this feels a little bit more daunting maybe to me, but it's good to be on the podcast. I just turned 55 and I'm at that stage where I'm I'm still flirting with menopause and it's kind of a bumpy relationship right now. So that's that's not fun, but that situates me in life for people who are listening. I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. And that was precisely the time when the whole diet culture was was really prevalent and taking off. And my journey to get where I am now started way back then already. Most of the kids in my grade were pretty thin. And those of us, though, who weren't, we knew what it felt like to feel different. And I was never a thin kid. I was never not obese at that time. I just was not skinny like most of the other kids were. So I recall from early on bringing like rice cakes and yogurt and oranges to school for lunch, or even as a young teenager already going to Weight Watchers for the first time. And that was all part of my journey, you know, going and doing all the fad diets that we all talk about, so many are familiar with, that worked briefly, but were always so restrictive and it felt even punitive to me to be doing those diets but it was this sense that I had that I was not good enough as I was. I remember that stigma. I was unique. I was one of the only kids in my class, the girls in my class, I remember that was not skinny. And I didn't really want to be skinny. I just, I wanted to, yeah, I, I just felt different. And I remember being told way back then that, wow, you'd be so pretty, Lisa, if you were, if you'd lose a little bit of weight or in high school, maybe you'd find a boyfriend if you would just lose some weight. And those were pretty clear messages that were sent to me. So all the shame and the feelings of inadequacy, that was all huge for me. I remember not wanting to care about how I physically occupied space. I recognized that clearly I was communicating 
that this was a struggle for me because I clearly remember when my grade eight teacher said something very careful to me, but compassionate. She said it very lovingly. I think she understood where I was coming from. And she made a comment about hoping that I wouldn't ultimately focus so much on body image and body size. And I've never forgotten that. I don't remember a lot about when I was a kid, but I remember her telling me that. They were words of wisdom for me that I've often thought of, and I've I've often felt, wow, I didn't listen to her very well. <laughs> I have lived my whole life, I feel like I've lived my whole life battling with my weight, with weight issues. And as I've thought about it, I recognize that it's been more mostly about my relationship with food and my relationship with my body. So I had internalized all of those messages that somehow my, my worth was found in my body size. So for over more than 30 years, that is what I was attached to. I battled my weight, even though I was advised not or encouraged not to. I, I tried to control my body size by controlling what I was eating. And I lived in that shame of not looking like my friends who they were all just very normal little girls. And like I said, I was just, I was solid. I was a solid kid. I was a farm girl and I dressed like a boy and I was just solid. But my self image was skewed by what I was hearing from others about what was acceptable or just seeing in messages, you know, on TV around me, whatever. And so I bought into the diet culture and all of those expectations And I lived off of Coke Zero or Diet Coke and crackers and fruit and tuna for so many dieting seasons of my life. And, you know, like many others, I love sugar and processed carbs, refined carbs. And that has been a pretty important part, pretty a big part of my journey has been to when I feel stress or angst or really any strong emotions, those things call my name. And so for all of those decades, really, combined with the pressure of wanting to look a certain way, I would give in to my, you know, those self-soothing behaviors with sugar or refined carbs and that yo-yo pattern was established early on. And that was, that was my life for more than, yeah, 35 years. So we fast forward now to the fall of 2018. So that means I've been part of the fasting method for over six years now. And when I started at the fasting method, it was again, yet again, out of a deep desire to gain some control over my over my health. It was about weight loss, especially in the beginning, but this time it was a little bit different. So 2018 was when I started. This time there were some added whys to my journey. So backing up a little bit, in 2012, I went through a a divorce. I I think I was going to say a hard divorce. I think all divorces are hard. (laughs) And this was after 20 years of relationship with my first husband. And by 2014, so two years later, I was on my own, raising our two daughters all by myself while managing a pretty responsible career. So 2014, my older brother died at age 47. He had brain cancer. And also in 2014, I met my second husband. And as our relationship grew, and it was this beautiful life-changing part of my journey, I observed At the same time, other family members getting sick and some of them dying at relatively young ages. So after my brother, an uncle, and an aunt, and I knew that my grandmother had died of non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver way back before they really knew what that was. And there was diabetes and heart disease and cancer. And here I was in my mid-40s at that time. So this is 10 years ago. I was obese. I wanted to lose about 100 pounds, or I needed to, and I was worried that I was going to go down a similar path as my other family members, and that my second husband and I would just not have enough years together. All I wanted was to create a life with him where we could share 
our life, share our love, and be good partners for as many years as we possibly could. But all of that, my family's health history, that was all convincing me that it could be short-lived. And it really suddenly felt urgent to prioritize my health. So that was the added layers, not just the weight loss. So then, okay, now we're back to the fall of 2018. And a friend of mine told me about Dr. Jason Fung and intermittent fasting. And I had never, this was brand new to me, but my life changed that day when she told me. It was a pivotal moment when I was just desperate to do anything to gain new health. And so that very day that she told me about whatever this is, Jason Bung and intermittent fasting, I was just desperate. And I will admit that probably there was some some of the same dieting mentality going on because it was this novelty of a new way of looking at things. It grabbed my attention. I remember spending the first days going down all the rabbit holes on YouTube and, and finding all the videos I could that Jason Fung had done and, and Megan Ramos. And I was just drinking it all up. And I very quickly started fasting. I made all the changes right away or I started and saw results very quickly. But I think it still was a dieting mentality at that time. So that journey early on, it was a pretty drastic linear journey for me through the fall of 2018 until the summer of 2019. So I don't even know, like whatever it was, eight months or something. But for the first time ever through fasting and getting rid of the sugar and the flour and refined carbs, I was free of the cravings and I was free of that seductive call that food has always had for me. So yeah, like that first year, I simply grabbed hold of the idea that yeah, we just eat too often. I remember reading in a book at some point, anyways, Life in the Fasting Lane. And uh, I read through that book. I've read lots of books. But that one, I remember Jason Fung saying in that book that fasting should be our default mode and eating is the exception, kind of. Yeah, That was huge for me because it, it really reinforced for me, yeah, we eat too often. I eat too often. I was used to the eating all the rice cakes or whatever and being hungry all the time. And so then I would just eat more low fat food. And this felt totally different as I was learning more about how to fast and and how to do this a healthy way. I also discovered that, you know, that idea that our bodies just need to rest and heal from eating. And again, that, that was a foreign concept for me. And so I grabbed on to those images of like, for example, visualizing my reserves of fat as refrigerator shelves. So when I would do longer fasts, you fast maybe 24 hours or more, I would just tell myself, nope, you've got lots on those shelves to eat from. You don't have to eat anything. And it was relatively easy. I remember so much of those early months of fasting, it became really easy. I remember saying over and over, wow, it's kind of effortless. This is amazing. I didn't crave anything and I could do longer fasts and I I felt good all of the time. I was never hungry, especially because I was living that low carb, kind of moderate protein and fat diet. I quickly switched from burning glucose to burning fat and I reached a healthy weight fairly quickly. By, by the summer of 2019, I was 110 pounds lower than my highest weight. And that was that was kind of at my goal weight. So then of course then we get to 2020 and we all know that was a pivotal year for history and I worked in seniors care at that time as a spiritual care provider and the pandemic was especially difficult in places like nursing homes and that's where I was. And I gained some weight back, not because I turned to food in the stress of it, but because I drastically turned down the fasting dial and that image of that dial. Wow. But I really did. I The stress was just beyond what I could manage. And I found myself thinking, I cannot fast. It was just a really hard time. And so I, I was also going through a job change process during that time, which is also hard to do during a pandemic. 
and life was just so surreal and crazy. And my two young daughters who were like 17 and 20 by them, they were struggling with the pandemic meant for their life. And yeah, I just, things shifted. It was not as easy. So as I did gain some weight back, I found myself going back to this place of shame. And I remember thinking, here I am, look at this. I'm competent in my work. I can do stuff. <laughs> and yet I can't, how can I not keep this weight off? How? Why am I again gaining weight back? And so it really jolted me, that experience and wondering, okay, so this isn't the diet, this is different, but why, I, I just found myself sitting in a place of shame again. So that that word shame keeps coming up. And that's that's mm-hmm. that's what I have really felt like has been such a big part of of life. And I think for a lot of people, we easily fall into places of shame. Lisa, if if we were I shouldn't say we, if you were going to write the story of your life and the story of your journey and the title included From Shame to What's on this side of shame? Yeah. So shame, shame, it would undo me and I would want to be invisible and I would not want to draw attention to myself. So moving from shame to showing up. So showing up for so many different things for myself, for one, Sitting in that shame was almost like a self-deprecating place where I would, I didn't hate myself, I didn't hate my body, but I, more than anything, I, I wanted to ignore it. I didn't want to draw attention to it. And I just want to pretend it didn't exist. But I learned eventually, and it actually came not, I hear it all the time in this community about the showing up showing up for our fasts, showing up for ourselves. But I actually, when I was training to be a spiritual care person 35 years ago, my supervisor in a hospital in Indiana told me, and again, I remember this clearly. He said, Lisa, one of the best things that you can ever do for other people is to just show up, just show up. That's the most important thing that you need to do. And I have held that so closely to me because it's for myself in my journey or on my journey, I show up for myself when I take care of myself, when I'm fasting, when I'm eating healthily. And I have learned so much over these six years about, you know, all the science stuff about food and our bodies. And I've listened to more podcasts than I ever would have imagined I would ever want to. And I can attest to you have a room full of books. I do. Maybe more than one room. (laughs) Yeah, I do. (laughs) Yeah. And there's so much important stuff there to learn. And I feel like I feel more knowledgeable I feel like I've shown up for myself in some really real and important ways, like learning, just learning all those things about how I could or should be eating. So I want to mention that one other part of shame, there's so many different ways that it has shown up over all these years, but one way that it does has been, for example, my my relationship with food, which is a pretty, I mean, a pretty common reality for a lot of people is that whole dieting mentality. And we, I, I've bought into that stigma. So it's taken me years to let go of that shame around my journey, where I was, where I came from, who I am now, thinking of the messages about our bodies and all the shoulds that people put on us. Here I have two daughters, I was going to say young daughters, they're they're in their 20s now, But I am so aware of how I have always talked to them about our bodies. And I remember being very, they were very young. And I always thought, I'm not going to let them see my shame. So we would stand in front of the mirror in the bathroom. And I would just did not want them to see me grimace at my image in the mirror. And I would just plaster a smile on my face and and say, I love my body. And I love how different we are all made and we all look so different. That's what I wanted them to remember. 
I didn't want them to remember that, oh yeah, mommy's always dieting or whatever. So that has been pretty important to me to keep keep a healthy image, not steeped in shame. Another angle of it was people sometimes give fasting a bad rap. There's a lot of criticism out there. It's so controversial. And my biggest thrill in my journey came early on. I had lost the weight already and I was feeling maybe criticized, maybe judged being on this fasting journey. But when I, this is about five years ago now, right before the pandemic, I had a doctor's appointment and I had a physical and I had just lost all that weight. And I I went to that appointment quite worried about what I was going to tell him. And I ended up just telling him that I had given up sugar and starches and that I was doing intermittent fasting. I actually said the fasting word. I wasn't sure I would. And he just beamed and said, good for you. I think everyone should fast. And that surprised me so much. And and he then pointed out how good my blood work was, how healthy I had become. And he just said, keep on doing what you're doing. Even once he retired and I got a new doctor in the last few years, again, I felt this little place of shame, you know, oh, I can't tell him. I can't tell him what I do, what I've done. And I did tell him. And again, he said the exact same thing. This new young doctor in a different clinic, like it wasn't like they were in the same kind of headspace. And he said, I support fasting 100%. Keep it up. You are the picture of health. And that those kinds of things have helped me to destigmatize. Is that a word? Destigmatize mm-hmm. for myself. It just gave me confidence in this way of life. And that feels good. And now I've been man- maintaining... Yes, I gained some weight back, but I've lost a bunch of it. And I've I've still maintained an 80-pound weight loss over six years. Over six years. Like, that's crazy. That For me. That defies every yeah. old statistic about weight loss mm. and maintenance of weight loss. Like, you've, yeah. you've broken that record. Yep. And I'm also thinking how much, even just that line that that doctor said, how much that really reinforced your newer whys that you came to in the journey, that this wasn't just about weight loss, but you wanted to safeguard yourself and your body from some of the health concerns that your family members had struggled with and that you watched them struggle with. Yeah. And here you are told you are, and I, let's face it, this is not a, a thing most doctors get to say very often. No, you're right. Yeah, that for me was, it was so affirming when I guess, I guess I, I felt like, again, that little bit of shame thinking that I'm doing something wrong. Like I'm not doing, our society doesn't very loudly endorse fasting. (laughs) I think more and more it does, or people just misunderstand it. They don't understand. And so it's seen with skepticism. So I, I expected my doctors to also not be on board. But in that kind of moment for both of those doctors, I just felt like, oh, I don't have to feel bad about this. I mean, again, when they confirmed that I'm so healthy at this point, like just a few months ago at an appointment, he looked at my blood work and he, he said, look at this. He goes, that A1C is beautiful. He goes, you are so far from diabetes. And I'm like, well, yes, I, that's exactly where I should be. I've been doing this for six years, you know. And so that's, for me, that is showing up to myself. That's that why that is reinforced every time. But I also show up for myself in so many different ways, not just the the health. I often say, because I'm so pleased with the change in myself, I used to want to be invisible. I virtually wanted to be invisible. I didn't want to draw attention to myself especially not my body. I did not want to accentuate my body at all. So the clothes that I bought, even the shoes that I bought, everything was, I bought it just to downplay myself. And now I can honestly say I'm so ridiculously at peace with my body. It's not perfect. Oh my goodness, it's not perfect. I still have about 25 pounds left that I want and need to lose to be a healthy weight, but I love the shopping now. And I used to loathe it. And I show up to myself when I put together a, a cute outfit that I feel good about and I feel good in. 
And I get excited about putting on cute accessories with my clothes, like whatever, earrings and a dress and new boots. And I mean, literally, I had hardly ever worn a dress in my life until 2019 when I suddenly realized, oh, it's like the shame fell away all of a sudden. And I suddenly realized, you know, I bet you a dress would look good on me now. And I just love how I feel in these things. So this whole sense of the shame shifting to showing up, and it's a whole new sense of embodiment. That's huge. And that did not happen in the first year or the first two years. That's been the last like two years, maybe. And to love myself, love my body. On a recent podcast episode with Kimberly Seitz, she mentioned a book, The Body's Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. And I read that book too a couple of years ago. I also listened to that author talking on someone's podcast a little while ago. And that got me going down that rabbit hole of body shame and self-love, embodiment in general, how we take up space, how we see ourselves, how we, again, show up for ourselves. So those kinds of books and people have been important. Another one was um, The Wisdom of Your Body by Hilary McBride. She has another one about mothers, daughters, and self-image or body image. And so this is all part of the showing up for myself and showing up, like, for my, like I said, for my daughters, you know, as they, they're on their own journeys of how they feel about their bodies and their relationships with their bodies and with food. And so it's so much bigger than a diet because, again, you can't diet for six years. <laughs> I'm also really struck by this image that I have as you've been talking in the past few minutes when you were younger, you were unlike the other girls in your class. You said, you know, you didn't fit in. And in a way, I'm going to take rice cakes and stuff so that I can be like them, so that my body could look more like their bodies. And at that point, obviously, most of us probably weren't thinking much about our health. I'm thinking about now, when you went to the doctor, the feedback that you've gotten, you don't fit in with everyone else your doctor is seeing. <laughs> You're not like them because your doctor is saying, oh my gosh, this is an amazing HbA1c. They don't get to say that very often. So it's kind of amazing to me how at one time not fitting in with your peers, mm -hmm. how isolating that felt and how much you kind of were striving then to make yourself become what was acceptable and now you've gotten to this place of showing up and now you're not like them again. Yeah. But because you're in a healthier place than most of your peers are at this stage. How ironic. Mm -hmm. That has occurred to me. I've thought that before. I've thought that before as I, for example, like for decades, I would sit on the couch and read and I, I hadn't been an exerciser. I wasn't very active for decades. And now as I'm running around on a pickleball court, like crazy, I mean, it's like I find myself thinking, who is this crazy middle-aged woman who has discovered movement? It's great. And that is showing up for myself. I recently was diagnosed with osteoarthritis in my knees, one especially, and it's bone on bone. And it was really painful. And my doctor said to me, he said, yeah, you can get on a list for knee replacement surgery like right now. He goes, or... You can try and do stuff to make it better. Like he said, you have to get the inflammation down. And I'm like, well, I know how to get inflammation down, you know, fasting. And he said, move more because the worst thing you can do is just sit still. And he said, you can lose 25 pounds. He said, that'll take the pressure off that knee. And I thought, I can do those things. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to say, oh, now I'm doomed to have surgery. I might have surgery at some point, but, mm -hmm. but those are all things. Again, I'm showing up for my knee these days. I'm, I take one of my dogs and out we go, even though this morning it was minus three degrees Celsius. And I thought, oh, winter's coming. But I, again, showing up, mm -hmm. whether it's putting on my shoes and going out for a walk or making sure I continue to fast as much as I need to be doing. Yeah. So Lisa, I'm curious, you've been talking about, you know, kind of the early knowing that you now, as you reflect on it, really coming from a place of shame and now being in this place of showing up. And I'm curious if you have a sense of maybe one or two of the biggest maybe factors or 
things that kind of guided you in that transition from shame to showing up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my journey does look very different than it did when I started. So when like six years ago, and along the way, there were times when I have felt like it was hard to show up. You know, suddenly I wasn't able to do things in the same way as I used to. My motivation was down or I simply, I just didn't have the energy anymore for it. And I I had to, in those times, I always knew that I was heading down a path. I was kind of in trouble if I was distancing myself from the community. And that has always helped me to keep my head in the game is when when I knew I really didn't feel like it anymore and I just I wanted to quit like times when I just thought almost a little bit whiny almost like a little kid saying I just don't want to do this anymore I don't want to have to think about this anymore mm-hmm. you know it happens a few times a year even where suddenly I'm like oh, can't I just forget about this and not do this anymore but it's at those times when it's not on my radar to show up for myself in that way but what ends up happening is that I realize, I recognize the slippery slope that it is. And I have come to see, I mean, we always talk about our identities, right? And I, over six years, gradually, my identity has shifted and shifted and changed to the point where I'll have people say to me, well, you're still not eating dessert. And I'll be like, no, I don't eat dessert. I, my health makes me not want to have dessert. I won't have dessert. I I don't eat sugar. But you can hear it in what they're saying. Oh, yeah. They're still thinking in diet mentality. Right. You're still dieting. Yeah. I thought you finished that thing exactly. where you weren't eating dessert. And people are always so surprised when I say, oh, yeah, I still don't eat dessert or I'm still not eating whatever. That is what has changed. And I have gradually... And I think it's through this community because all of the mindset, so often the mindset and emotions and habits meetings, I mean, you can learn all the science of fasting and eating healthily, but it's all that other stuff that addresses that relationship with food and your identity. You know, I no longer say I am an emotional eater. I don't say that. I mean, I still tend to... When I'm in an emotional, weird place, I crave something, but I don't give in to that being my identity. I have come to see that, no, that's not where I'm I'm at. My identity is different than that. And so the big shift I think that had to happen was to see like any other aspect of my life that is worthwhile to me, like for example, my marriage, we've just celebrated 10 years of meeting my husband and I, and we we met and within a year we were married. And we work at our marriage. We find it's just so important. So just like putting in, you know, the discipline for a marriage relationship or my work, my career, I mean, to stay kind of on top of things, I need to do continuing education and I need to read more books and I need to go to conferences or whatever. Like all of it is regular discipline. I play piano and I took lessons forever when I was a kid for 10 years and I practiced. I had to practice. I knew I had to if I was going to keep improving or keep being a piano player, right? And so that's how I see this way of life showing up for myself. I don't always want to. I also always didn't want to practice piano. I don't always want to go out for a walk when it's cold. But that's where the rubber hits the road. And that I feel like has been something that over the last few years has just kind of solidified more and more that, yeah, I don't always want to do it. And and it doesn't look perfect. It doesn't have to look, I mean, my goodness, six years. I'm glad I didn't know when I started that I was going to be, <laughs> I did really think that it was going to be, you know, a set period of time and then you'd be done with that and move on. But no, this is my way of life. And I, I feel confident in that. I feel so fantastic physically. I've worked hard to get my sleep good. Like yet another thing that, you know, it's worthwhile making that effort. I know that if I change some habits, I won't be sleeping well again. And slowly over six years, I've changed habits, like giving up along the way. Early on, sugar, refined carbs. After four years, I gave up well, five years, gave up Coke Zero finally. You know, I haven't had one now for almost a year. 
Woo. Nice. And that was a big one. Mostly given up alcohol because I know that it just does not. I mean, especially now with this knee thing and, you know, the inflammation, I'm, I think, you know what? Nothing in me needs that alcohol. My sleep doesn't need it, whatever. And so I, I'm slowly tweaking things. And all that is part of that loving myself and showing up for myself. I love it. And I, I love, Lisa, that you really kind of walked us through not just the history, but the the transformation. And you know, that's a big word for me in this journey. And you've really transformed. And I think that's what's so important. I think people can do a lot of temporary changes without transforming. And we're never satisfied with that. And most of us have done that 10, 20, 30, 100 times. And what you're talking about is that you've really been transforming in these past six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. And it'll look different with each passing, whatever, month or year. That's right. Yeah. And that's okay. But also the idea then your transformation doesn't just end. <laughs> right. Yeah. It just looks different. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, Lisa, I, I just wanted to thank you so much. You do so much in our community. And I always feel so lucky when you come to my meetings and help <laughs> out. And um, it's fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that to me, that's another way that you show up you know, you're sharing your experience and your art of giving to help other people in this journey as well. So thank you so much for joining me today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I think it takes some nerve and some some courage to, to come on to a podcast when we're not used to that. So it does. thank you so much. You're welcome. And I will continue to get to see you in your journey. Thanks. Very good. Okay. Take care. All right, everyone, take good care, and we will be back for another episode of the Fasting Method podcast next week. Bye, everybody.